might into every follower of Christ. As we turn away from darkness and we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ to be our Savior, He shines forth the light of God, the light of the gospel, the light of truth into every heart. And then He bids us to reflect that light, His own light, so that we will be the children of God and the children of light and children of righteousness. This light begins at the point of salvation and then it goes on in our lives to further, higher, deeper experiences until we see the Lord face to face. Look at Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. But the path of the just is at the shining light that shineth, look at this, more and more. The light of the believer's life should not grow dim, but it should be brighter and brighter. It should shine forth more and more unto the perfect day. That leaves no room for backsliding. It doesn't make anyone to say, okay, I'm shining now. I will grow less. I will shine less. But no. It tells us we go higher and higher. We shine brighter and brighter until the perfect day. Job chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 9. Job chapter 17, verse 9. The righteous also shall hold on his way. And he that has clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. And so as we are lights in the world, everywhere we go, we shine forth. And the more we know the Lord, and the more we get closer to the Lord, and the more we experience the Lord, having definite Christian experiences, we shine more and more. John chapter 9, verse 4. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. He was the light, that shiny light. And he's passed that across to us, that we too should shine, and shine more and more. In his light, with his light. John chapter 12, reading from verse 46. John 12, Reading from verse 46, I am come a light into the world that whosoever, anyone gets born again, anyone who believes, anyone who follows the Lord, that whosoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Is the light of the world, and when we come to him, converted to him, connected to him, we shine forth in the very light of Christ. First John chapter 1, reading from verse 5. First John chapter 1, verse 5. This then is the message which ye have heard of him. Not just that you have heard it of the preachers in general, or you have heard it of the apostles in general, we have heard of him, of the Lord Jesus Christ. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you what we heard from Christ, from the Lord, from our Savior and Lord, from our Master. That's exactly what we declare. We declare unto you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him 
and walk in darkness will lie and do not the truth. If we walk in the light, if we live in the light, if we manifest the light, if we reflect the light of Christ, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, understand that comparison, as he is in the light, as Christ is in the light, as Christ walks in the light, as Christ manifested the light, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I pray that the light of Christ will shine in every one of our hearts. In Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 14, all through to verse 16, do all things without murmurings and disputings, that she may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. It's very clear in the Word of God, Old Testament, New Testament, consistently, that if we are Christians, if we are born again, if we are children of God, we'll be children of light, we'll walk in the light, we'll live in the light, we'll do everything we do in the light, that the light of Christ, the light of Christian character might shine forth through us. And it says we're shining as light in the perverse, crooked, corrupt world holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. What has the Philippians walking in the light got to do with Paul the apostle rejoicing in the day of Christ? The meaning is this. If the believers converted through the preaching of Paul the apostle, matured through the discipline, of Paul the Apostle, if they walked in the light, then Paul the Apostle will have something to show for his ministry in the day, on the day of reckoning. And then there will be reward for what he had done. And then he will rejoice. If on the other hand, they claim to be born again, they claim to be converted, they claim to have come to the Lord through the ministry of Paul the Apostle, but we are walking in darkness, darkness of character, darkness of behavior, darkness of occultism, darkness of evil, then they will not make heaven at last. And when Paul the Apostle comes to the day of reckoning, what will be his fruit? There will be no joy. I pray we'll have joy over you in Jesus' name. Holding fast the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. The Lord likens the true believer, the true followers of Christ, to light and salt, salt and light. That means we're not supposed to be gall, bitter, darkness as children of night, we're not supposed to be bitter and to be in the dark, bad or poisonous. We're supposed to be influential in a positive way, in a good direction, influencing the people we interact with, getting sinners to become conscious of their sin and then getting them to be convicted of their evil getting them to place their confidence and faith in Christ. We should so influence sinners around us that those sinners will like to be like we are, born again, believers, children of God, walking in righteousness and the light. And then we should influence the saints, the children of God, that the children of God will also like to move forward. They like to progress because of the power, 
because of the influence of our lives on them. Tonight, we're looking at the message, Reflecting Christ's Shining Light in a Dark, Corrupt World. He is the light, and it's always shining. And we're reflecting that shining light of Christ in the world in which we live, dark and corrupt. Reflecting Christ's shining light in a dark, corrupt world. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the usefulness and characteristics of salty, sanctified servants. The usefulness and characteristics of salty, sanctified servants. Look at Matthew chapter 5, reading the first part of verse 13. Matthew chapter 5, the first part of verse 13. Ye are the salt of the earth. He spoke to them individually. He spoke to them corporately. He spoke to them as individual Peter, individual John, individual Andrew, individual Matthew, individual believers. And he speaks to you as an individual. Ye are the salt of the earth. But he also spoke to them as an assembly, a congregation, a fellowship of believers and saints. You all together, you are the salt of the earth. As we mention salt like this, we need to understand that God makes use of that word salt, number one, in our private lives, number two, in our families, number three, in the worship of God, number four, in the world at large. Look at how God uses that word salt, and he uses salt itself in various ways. And the Lord is telling us, this is who we are. This is what we are. Leviticus chapter 2. In Leviticus chapter 2, we're reading from verse 13. Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13. And every oblation of thy meat offering shall thou season with salt. That's worship. Your offering to the Lord, your sacrificing to the Lord. And he says that offering must be seasoned with salt. Neither shall thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from the meat offering. Never forget that. You're offering something to the Lord. It's a burnt offering. It's a meat offering. And you're offering it as a sweet odor unto the Lord. The salt must not be lacking. With all thy offerings, all thy offerings, all thy offerings, thou shalt offer salt. You must be asking yourself, in the things you offer to the Lord, is it the sweetness of grace there? And the sweetness of pleasure, what pleases the Lord there? Or do you just offer, whether it's lacking in salt, in sweetness, in seasoning or not? In Ezekiel chapter 43. Ezekiel chapter 43. We're reading from verse 24. Ezekiel 43. Reading from verse 24. And thou shalt offer them before the Lord, and the priest shall cast salt upon them. As you are offering to the Lord, you offer yourself to the Lord, you offer your service to the Lord, and you offer your skill to the Lord, you offer even your prayers unto the Lord. Is it seasoned with the salt of grace? Is it seasoned with the salt that pleases the Lord? Or oh, they told us to do it, we're doing it. The heart is not there, grace is not there, 
pleasing the Lord is not there. The thoughtfulness of this is going to the Lord, and I must offer it with all my heart. If that is not there, then you have not really understood the use of salt in the sacrifice of the Lord. It says, and the priest shall cast salt upon them, and they shall offer them for a burnt offering unto the Lord. Let's come back to Job chapter 6, and we're reading from verse 6. Job chapter 6, verse 6. In the sight of God, in the service of God, the way he uses salt, and the way he expects us to bring salt with our service, with everything that we render. Look at Job chapter 6, verse 6. Can that which is unsavory be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? It's telling us that the spiritual meal that we serve, we must put salt there. And there are some doctrines that naturally, normally, for the people who are hearing, it may not be very pleasant to them. We're talking about restitution. That's not always a pleasant a doctrine. We're talking about sacrifice, self-denial. That's not always a pleasant a teaching. We're talking about the end of sinners, that they go to hell at the end of living in sin. It's not a pleasant doctrine. And if we don't have the salt of grace mixed with what we're teaching, then it's so savory. It's tasteless, and the people reject. The Lord is saying that you look for that salt of grace and sprinkle on what you are teaching, and sprinkle on the bread of life, and sprinkle on the meat you are giving to the people. Only then will you be very fruitful, and only then will people accept what you are teaching, take in what you are teaching, and live by what you are teaching. Let's come to Second Kings chapter 2. Second Kings chapter 2. We're reading from verse 19. In Second Kings chapter 2, verse 19. And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of the city is pleasant. As my Lord sees, but the water is not, and the ground barren. And you look at a situation, take for example, in this condition in which we are, you have a house, or you have rented a house, and the landlord has built the house very well. As for the solidity of the house, perfect. As for the foundation of the house, perfect. As to the painting of the house, perfect. As to the ceiling, perfect. The only thing is, it's always hot. And in hot season, it gives you not just discomfort, it gives you possibility of getting sick because of that situation. No aircon, or the aircon is not functioning. And even if there is fan, the fan is blowing hot air. You are not even able to sleep at night. You want to take your mat or your mattress and spread it outside and go and sleep in the open. Except it is not wise to do that because of security. And that's the situation they had over there. And he told Elisha, they said, you know, if you look at the city, if you look at the layout, if you look at the mapping, if you look at all the buildings, everything looks nice. But the water, just the water is not. And the ground is barren. Look at verse 20. And he said, bring me a new cruise and put salt therein. As we come to our own situation, look at our church. Look at the building. Look at everything. Everything is fine. Everything is good. It's standard. It's a model. And people that see it in picture, they say, this is wonderful. How about the people that worship inside that building? Do you have salt? 
They will seize in each other. They will encourage each other. Are we happy to be here? Are we as nice as the building itself? Are we as solid as the building itself? Do we look nice to ourselves as the building looks nice to people? That's what we're talking about. And the Lord wants salt in our sacrifice. And in every situation, he says, bring me a new cruise and, and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. Look at this. And he went forth unto the spring of waters, to the very source, and cast the salt in there, and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed these waters by the putting in of the salt. You know what the Lord is saying? Ye are the salt of the earth. The earth around us, the world around us is sick, is barren, unproductive, and fruitless. And we are the salt. We get into their lives. We get into those communities. And our presence in those communities actually makes the communities better, fresh, fruitful, productive. It says in verse 22, so the waters were healed. Salt, from the perspective of God, heals. It heals wounds. It heals individuals. It heals families. It's saying that it's not just that we have the name of Jesus, we have the believer. And the believer is salt. It's a healing agent in the community. It's a healing agent in the assembly. It's a healing agent in the church. It's a healing agent in the congregation. Are you a healing agent in the house fellowship? When people are down, when people are wounded, when people are hurt, when people are having blisters in their mouth, blisters in their eyes, blisters on their hands, blisters in their body. Your presence in that house fellowship, your presence in that region, your presence in that state, your presence in the community of believers, does it bring healing to them or it hurts them more, destroys them. It says, so the waters were healed unto this day. According to the saying of Elisha, which he spake, I pray will be healing agents in Jesus' name. No wonder Jesus said in Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9, and I'm reading from verse 50. Come to verse 49. For everyone must be salted with fire. And every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Every sacrifice, every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. If the sacrifice is just brought, the salt demanded by God, the salt required for the sacrifice is not there. I sacrifice, I sacrifice, I sacrifice with grumbling, that's not salt. I sacrifice with complaint, that's not salt. I sacrifice with slander, that's not salt. I sacrifice with envy. I'm envying others who are also sacrificing. That's not salt. I am sacrificing, but I'm grudging. I'm, okay, we have to do this again. Okay, we have to go through this again. Okay, we have to spend all this time again. There's no salt there. But when there's cheerfulness, when there's joy, the joy of service, when there is love, when there is fellowship, and where there is understanding, good understandings between us, that's the salt. It says every sacrifice must be seasoned, salted with salt. Salt is good. But if the salt have lost its saltness, where which will ye season it? Have salt in yourselves. It comes from your heart. Salt in yourself. Grace in yourself. Love in yourself. 
desire in yourself, passion in yourself, have the joy to minister in yourself. Not just that you are dragging yourself. Okay, we'll do it. Okay, we'll evangelize. Okay, we will serve. Okay, we will sing. Okay, we'll do whatever. But it's no salt. And the service is not sweet. And the newcomers do not feel like coming again. And the newcomers in the house fellowship, they said, is this what they call fellowship? I don't think I'm going to come again. There's no salt there. In the family, you know, the children are eager to get out of the house. They cannot live there. It's too hot for them, and it's too bitter for them. There's too much argument. There is no salt. But when the salt is there, and I want more of that meal, and I want more of that fellowship, and I want more of that interaction, I want to come back there again. It's so nice being there. Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. That, that's what we need. Without that peace, without that salt, there is not much we're offering to the Lord. Colossians chapter 4. In Colossians chapter 4, we're reading from verse 5. Colossians chapter 4, reading from verse 5. It says, walk in wisdom towards them that are without redeeming the time. Walk in wisdom. What kind of wisdom? Godly wisdom. What kind of wisdom? Christ's wisdom. What kind of wisdom? Pleasant wisdom. It is not talking about being crafty. It's not talking about cunningness. It's not talking about craftiness. It's not talking about deception. It's not talking about hypocrisy. It's not talking about deceiving other people. This is the wisdom of God that comes in the light and with the light. And then it says towards them that are without redeeming the time, buying up the opportunities, the opportunity you have to touch a life, redeem the time. The opportunity you have to solve the problem, redeem the time. The opportunity you have to touch somebody's life and turn that life up so that that person will look up and be happy, a happy neighbor. Redeeming the time, let your speech be, what's the next word there? I said, what's the next word there? I can't hear my people. Say that again. Let your speech be always with grace. Always. 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 Uh, you know, there are times when we're tired, but grace must still be there. There are times when, you know, things are not just working right physically. We must still have the grace of God. There are times when we have some problems on our mind. You know, something happened on the road, something happened in the family, something happened in the school, something happened at uh, your place of work. But always, always, whatever may be happening, let your speech, once you open your mouth, let grace come out. Whatever is happening around you, whatever is happening within you, let your speech be always with grace. If you cannot speak with grace, don't talk, go aside, spend some time and have more grace of God in your life. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. Your speech was salt. Your attitude was salt. Your interaction was salt. Your fellowship was salt. And your action, everything you do, let it be seasoned with salt, that she may know how ye ought to answer every man. Every man. There are difficult men, every man. There are people it's difficult to, you know, relate with, but all the same from your own angle of the matter. Let there be peace and know how you ought to answer every man. You know what the Lord is telling us about salt? is saying that all of us who are converted to Christ, all of us who are believers in Christ, we should have and we should possess and we should demonstrate the characteristics of salt. What are those characteristics? Number one, pure 
and white. If that salt is not pure, you can't use it. If it is not having the right color, you can't use it. If there is sand mixed with the salt, you can't use it. Because for the salt to be useful, there must be the purity and the whiteness. That's about your life. You must be pure, and you must have pure intention and pure motive and pure action. Number one, pure and white. Number two, separate and clean. Separate and clean. That's why we put the salt in the container to be separated from everything around. Because if that salt is not separate, it's not going to be useful. It's of no use. It must be clean. And the only way it can remain clean is to be separate. I about your life. Are you separate from the corruption in the society? from the darkness in society and from the commotion, the crisis in society. Are you one of the people carrying placards and, uh, you know, singing war songs? This is going to happen. Then you are not salt. You are mixed with the people and you are no more salt. Number one, pure and white. Number two, separate and clean. Number three, preserved and unsoiled. Preserved and unsoiled. You have to take care of it very well and they put on the cover of that bottle and make sure that there is no bacteria that is getting into that bottle. It must be preserved in its normal nature, characteristic, unsoiled. Number four, sweet and seasoning. Sweet and seasoning. Hey, think about yourself. Would you think about yourself honestly? as a sweet person, a nice person from the heart, is able to walk with you and live with you and interact with you, or people are um, just tolerating you. It's one of us who cannot do otherwise. We have to go along with him. It's unpleasant. He doesn't think that he ought to be a blessing to another person. He's self-centered. Is self willed, is stubborn, is incorrigible, but what can we do? It's one of us, we just try to get along. Anytime we can avoid him and still get on, we say bye bye, good riddance. But if you are salt, you must be sweet and seasoning. Number five, useful when diffused. Useful. When that feels, if you keep it in the bottle all the time and you don't take out of it to sprinkle on your food, it's useless. And the same thing with Christians, they say they are holy, they say they are pure, but they are not diffused, they do not interact, they do not touch lives, they do not go to people and to places. You're only useful when the salt is diffused. Number six, Unique and universal. Unique. Salt is like no other ingredient. You cannot say, this is salt. This is not salt, but it's like salt. No, not at all. Artificial salt will not do. It's unique and it is universal. The white takes salt, the blacks take salt, Africans take salt, and Americans take salt. The young, the old, the men, the women, we all take salt. It is universal. Are you a universal Christian like that? When, where you go, they don't recognize whether you are Yoruba or Igbo, you are Epic, you are Hausa. You are just salt, salt. And they don't recognize whether you are from another West African country or you are Southern African country or you are East Africa. Whether you are French or you are English, you are just salt. There is no discrimination in salt. It is unique and universal. How about your own Christian life? How about the people you stretch your hand of fellowship to and the people you bring into the service? Uh-uh, that one is not from my tribe. 
That one does not speak my local language. That one, I, I can't trust anybody that is not from my area. Not salt. Salt is unique and universal. Number seven, preserving and the influential. Preserving. Uh, it preserves meat from going bad. It was actually used for refrigeration in those old days so that the meat will not go rotting, preserving and influential. And that's the life of a believer. Do you preserve people who come under your influence from corruption, from evil, from sinning, from backsliding, from temptation? If you are salt, you'll be preserving and you'll be influential. Anywhere you go, in the midst of any people, if there's any confusion, you set it right. If there is any sin that is not really up to standard, you set it in order because you are preserving your influential. Number eight, purifying and healing. Purifying and healing. It takes impurities away. It takes the putrefaction away from, you know, whatever meat or whatever food you're putting it into. It purifies it. It heals it. Sometimes you have uh, some wound in the mouth and you're told to take some salt and put in water and gaggle with it and rinse your mouth with it. By the time you do that a few times, all those uh, wounds are healed, purifying and healing. Does your life heal people? Or your life wounds people. Your life creates wounds and sores in the lives of people. Number nine, constant and predictable. Constant and predictable. If you know anything about salt, you've had it in the bottle for some time now, and then you bring it up again, it still retains the normal seasoning and sweetness. Constant. It's predictable. Predictable. Anytime you take that salt, you can predict what the taste will look like. Are you predictable or are you like sour? Sometimes when you're happy, sweet. And sometimes when everything is all right, when you feel everything is okay, then you are very nice. But when something steps on your toe, then you are not as nice as you ought to be. You are not predictable. But in the case of salt, constant and predictable, number 10, needed by saints and sinners. Everybody needs salt. The sinners need salt. The saints need salt. The old need salt. And the young need salt. We all need the salt. And the Lord is saying, yeah, the salt of the earth. Make sure that you are needed everywhere you go. Needed by saints and sinners. Number 11, indispensable and irreplaceable. You cannot deal without salt, generally. Indispensable and irreplaceable. There is no alternative. You cannot say, I'll replace that salt with this. I'll try this. No, it doesn't match. Because salt is indispensable and irreplaceable. Number 12, serviceable to God and man. Have you noticed in the word of God how God said, I need that salt. Put it in my sacrifice. It's serviceable to God and it is serviceable unto man. Man needs it as well. I pray that our lives will be like that. My life will be like that. Pure and white. Separate and clean. Preserved and unsoiled. Sweet and seasoning. Useful when diffused. Unique and universal. Preserving and influential, purifying and healing, constant and predictable, needed by saints and sinners, indispensable and irreplaceable, serviceable to God and man. Point number two now, the uselessness and casting away of savorless, sandy salt. If you allow the salt 
to be mixed with sand, sandy salt, savorless. It's lost its sweetness, lost its savor, lost its seasoning attribute. It's to be cast away. And now it is useless. The uselessness and the casting away of savorless, sandy salt. We're coming to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We're reading from verse 13. Matthew chapter 5. Reading from verse 13. Yeah, the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, if the salt have lost its savor, where we shall it be salted? It is this forth good for nothing. Good for nothing. But to be cast out and to be trodden on the foot of men. Once it becomes sandy salt, simplest salt, it is cast away. Mark chapter 9, reading from verse 50. It says in verse 50, salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltness, when we shall ye season it. The Lord Jesus Christ said it over and over at different times that it is possible for the salt to lose its savor. Luke chapter 14, reading from verse 34. Luke chapter 14, reading from verse 34. In verse 34, salt is good. But if the salt have lost its savor, where we shall leach be seasoned. You see that again, the words of Jesus, it is neither feet for the land, nor yet for the donkey, but men cast it out. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. I pray we'll have ears to hear. I said we'll have ears to hear. When he says he is talking to the individual, the individual that has ears to hear, that the possibility is there for the soul to lose its savor and therefore to gird against that lostness. That's the one that has ear to hear. But the one that hears... I never thinks about it, I never walks on it, and until the saltiness and the savor and the sweetness is gone, he doesn't take care. That person doesn't make use of the word of Christ, and eventually the Lord said he'll be cast out, he'll be cast away, he'll be cast forth, he'll be cast off. We're coming to First Kings chapter 9. First Kings chapter 9, we're reading from verse 6. First Kings chapter 9, verse 6. It says in verse 6, But if ye shall at all turn from following me, ye or your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have said before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them. Then will I cut off Israel. Israel, a nation losing its saltiness. The church as a denomination losing its saltiness. The local church as a local assembly losing its saltiness. Lost the favor and the savor of the doctrine that changes life, turns life around. It says, I will cut off Israel 
out of the land which I have given them, and this house which I have hallowed for my name. Don't forget that. The house of God is hallowed for his name. Not for a man, not for a woman, not for any officer, not for any individual. The house of God is built and is put there for people to come and find it pleasant in coming to worship the Lord. But it says, if those people, if they abandon the word of God, it says, this house which I've hallowed for my name, will I cast out of my sight. And Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people. You see that the Lord wants us to preserve the sweetness, the savor, and the grace, and the love, and the thing that will help us to present our sacrifice unto the Lord. Second Kings chapter 17, verse 17. There's a possibility if we lose our Christian experiences, and we lose what makes us to be like Christ, and we lose the grace of God from our lives, and we lose the glory of the Christian life from our lives. The possibility is there that it can be lost, that salvation and that experience, and then we are cast forth and we are cast away from the Lord. In 2 Kings chapter 17, we're reading from verse 17, 17, 17. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and use divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil. They committed themselves to doing evil. They sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. When people sell themselves to do evil, they've lost the salt of the grace of God, the salt of the Christian experience. And when that savor is lost, when that sweetness is lost, when that Christian experience is lost, look at what follows verse 18. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. That's been cast off. The presence of God is taken away. The protection of God is taken away. The power of God is taken away. And there was none left but the tribe of Judah only. Also Judah kept not the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the statutes of Israel, which they made, and the Lord rejected all the seed of Israel and afflicted them and delivered them into the hands of the spoilers until he had cast them out of his sight. That's the meaning. The salt that lost its savor, cast off, cast out, away from the presence of the Lord. In Luke chapter 9, reading from verse 25, Luke chapter 9, verse 25. In Luke chapter 9, verse 25, here is what the Lord Jesus said, for what is a man advantaged? What is a man profited? What's it good for the man? If he gained the whole world, and lose himself or be cast away. He loses himself. He loses himself into the hands of Satan. Satan wants a tool, and he's a ready tool in the hands of Satan. He loses himself into the hands of sin. Sin is going about searching for who sin will dominate, and he was available. He loses himself into sin. He loses himself into the hands of society, and because society is corrupt, the society swallows him up. And now he's lost himself into 
to judgment forever and ever in all eternity. We're looking at Matthew chapter 3. In Matthew chapter 3, here we're reading from verse 8. Matthew chapter 3, we're reading from verse 8. In verse 8, it says, Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Verse 10, and now also, the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Trees in the plural, all the trees. Everyone will answer for himself. All the trees. I'm following Christ. I'm following the face of Abraham. I'm a child of God. Are you bearing fruit? Are you still having the seasoning attribute of the salt? Are you sweet? Sweet to God? Pleasant to God and sweet in the house of God to the people of God. And now also the axe is laid upon the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree, notice that, every tree of whatever religious persuasion, every tree of whatever local church, every tree of whatever denomination, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. That's a casting away, a casting away. We're looking at Matthew chapter 8. In Matthew chapter 8, I read from verse 11. Matthew chapter 8, reading from verse 11. It says in verse 11, And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and from the west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. That is, those whose right it is to lay claim to the kingdom. And Jesus came to them, he came unto his own, but his own received him not, because they received him not, and they didn't have the salt of grace in their lives, no salvation, no new birth experience, and no connection with Christ, because of their choice, they'll be cast out into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew chapter 13, we're reading from verse 47. Matthew chapter 13, reading from verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the goods into the vessels but cast the bad away, so shall it be. At the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and sever, separate the wicked from the among the jaws, and shall cast them, that's the word, and shall cast them, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. There's a casting off. There's a casting away. There's a casting forth. There's casting off from the kingdom of God. If the salt loses its savor, if the believer loses its seasoning attitude and attribute and loses the savor, the grace, the salvation, that shall make him the salt of the earth. If the believer loses that, is left shallow, is left empty, is left useless, and it is cast away. We're looking at chapter 25 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 25, reading from verse 26. His Lord answered and said unto him, 
the wicked and slothful servant. This person had lost the savor, began to accuse the Lord. You're a tax master, you're hard, you're austere, you demand service, you demand this, you want fruit where well, you have not sold, you want me to be doing the laboring, laboring. And the Lord said, wicked and slothful servant, that noise that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strayed. Look at verse 30 now. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. What kind of servant are you? Are you profitable for the kingdom? Are you profitable for the church? Are you profitable for the people of God? Are you profitable to the people you are leading? Are you profitable to the people you are supposed to season and make their lives sweet and pleasant? Or you make their life oppressed and you make them tired and worn out? as if they should not do what the Lord has called them to do. It says they'll be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We're coming to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. We're reading from verse 6. John chapter 15. Verse 6, if a man abide not in me, that's how they lose salvation. If a man abide not in me, that's how they sever relationship with the Lord. If a man abideth not in me, that's how the salt loses its saltiness. If a man abide not in me, that's how a follower loses the characteristics of Christ. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. And is withered, and men gathered them and cast them into the fire, and they are burnt. He's talking about final casting away, final casting out, final casting out. If somebody remains in sin after he was born again, then he backslid, then he remained in that backsliding, and he remains in that sin. Until death comes, sometimes sudden death is not good. It's not good to suffer and suffer and get sick and, you know, the person is in pain. But there's one side of that. If somebody is sick, having pains and is praying, searching his life, what's the cause of this sickness? Have I done something wrong? Have I misbehaved? Have I cast off my false faith? That person has a chance to repent, has a chance to reconnect again, has a chance to get the salt back into his life. But if somebody dies suddenly, no chance to examine himself, no chance to look over his life, no chance to get ready, no chance to get the saltiness and the savor and the seasoning, and the sweetness, and the grace back into his life, and he's cut off. Then that person goes to sudden perdition. But while you have life, and while you have opportunity to live, don't just take things for granted. That's what Jesus said. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. Lest it comes to that point where... He is cast off by men, he is cast off by God, he is cast off by Christ. And it's a casting off that is final. It's a casting off that is at the last time. It's a casting off that is at the end. And such casting off is irretrievable. Such casting off is irrecoverable. Such casting off is irredeemable. There's no second chance to get salvation after death. There's no second chance to repent after death. There's no second chance to link up with God, reconcile with God again 
after death. Now is the day, the only time when we can have restoration, reconciliation, renewal, and bring yourself back to the altar and renew your vow. And the Lord restore everyone that has gone away from him in Jesus' name. I thought church headquarters would say amen. amen. First Corinthians chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 27. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27. But I keep under my body and bring each into subjection.